Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Breakdown, where I take your suggestions on cool sequences or effects from movies, TV shows, games, or anything else, and try to recreate them. In this video, we'll be recreating the title sequences from the Chucky TV show, which have a couple variations with different lighting and objects, but the essence is the same. What we're really trying to do here is have an object or group of objects float around and form the word we want it to. And we can break that down into a couple broad steps. Step 1, create our letters, easy. Step 2, create a particle emitter inside of the letter that emits the object we want to fill the letter with. Step 3, simulate physics for our objects with collisions so that they bounce off of each other instead of just floating through one another. And step 4, don't render the letter so that all we see are the floating objects that form the letters. Now those are some pretty simplified steps but more or less an accurate roadmap for the rest of this tutorial. So let's get straight to it by opening up Blender and getting started with step 1, setting up our letters. Go ahead and kill the cube and then hit shift A to create some text. Then hitting tab to enter edit mode, go ahead and write your full word out before tabbing back into object mode. Then let's rotate our text by 90 degrees on the X axis so that it isn't laying down and then go over to its properties and choose the font we want here. The font for the Chucky intro is called Futura Extra Black BT, but it isn't a free font, so you'll have to <clears throat> find it on your own. After we've got a preferably thick font picked out, hit 1 on your number pad or use the gizmo up here to jump to the front view. Then let's hit S and increase the scale until it looks about 4 meters tall, which you can tell by looking at the grid. Then after we've scaled it up, we're just going to apply the scale to the text by hitting Ctrl or Command A and choosing Scale, which just basically changes how Blender sees the text. Now it's not small text that's been scaled up a lot, it's just naturally big text. And that matters because when we extrude it in a moment, the value we extrude it by is going to be multiplied by the scale of our text. Since our scale is applied, when we head to the geometry properties of our text and extrude it by 0.8 meters, it's actually going to extrude by 0.8 meters instead of something way bigger had we not applied the scale first. Now that we're happy with our text, let's right click it and convert it to a mesh. An optional step we can take to tidy up our mesh a little bit more is to add the decimate modifier to it and set it to planar. If I jump into wireframe view for a sec and turn the modifier on and off, you can see that the naturally generated mesh goes a bit overboard. So decimating it on planar with an angle limit of about five degrees should be good. So go ahead and apply the modifier. Now we want to take this full word and break each letter into their own objects. And there's a pretty simple way to do it, but sometimes depending on your font, converting it to a mesh doesn't do a great job of joining all the faces together correctly. So what we've got to do first is hit tab to go into edit mode, hit A to select all, and then head to mesh, clean up, merge by distance. Making sure you've got a real small distance set, you'll probably notice down here that you're cleaning up a lot of unnecessary points. Now after that, if we hit A again, right click and choose separate by loose parts, then tab back into object mode, we should see that each of our letters is set up as their own objects. Now selecting each letter in turn, I'm going to hit M to create a new collection for them, and then just name it so you can tell which letter is which. And you definitely do not want to skip this step, it's not just me being overly organized. In the next couple parts, we're going to be adding hundreds of objects into the scene, and it's going to get real messy unless we have collections for each letter. Now after we put each letter into its own collection, go ahead and hide all of the letters except for the first one so that we can work on things one at a time. Finally, to prep our letter for the next step where we use a particle emitter, let's head over here to the physics tab and add a regular collision property to it. And lastly, in our scene properties, let's just set our gravity to 0 meters per second squared. 0 meters per second squared. Now we're on to step 2 where we'll need to make our particle emitter. So go ahead and hit shift A and make a plane, then scale it down to fit inside of our letter. Now just a quick tip here, we can quickly zoom into selected objects by first making sure they are selected, then with our mouse over the viewport, hitting period on the number pad. Pretty handy, I use it all the time. Now once you've got the plane in place inside of your letter, head over to the particle tab and hit the plus to add a new particle system. Since we've already added a collision property to the letter, if we hit play, particles should start emitting from our plane and bouncing, which is great. But we don't want our particles to be spheres, we want them to be an object or a group of objects. In the Chucky intros, sometimes they're doll parts, sometimes knives, and in my example, I used a model I made of my glasses. Whatever you want to use, go ahead and import the object, and if it's multiple objects, all you need to do differently is make sure you select them both and hit M to move them into a collection together. Now in the particle emitter settings under the render tab, set it to render as either an object if you're using just one object, or collection if you're using multiple. Then just pick your object or collection using the eyedropper and you should see the emitter has switched to emitting what we need it to. Next just bring up the scale here to 1 so that the emitted particles are going to be the same size as our object or objects that we're using as the source. We're almost done with this step now, we've just got a few more settings to change. What we're trying to accomplish here is have a bunch of objects spawn inside of our letter, have some time to bounce around so that they're spread out evenly, and then freeze them as they are. The whole point of this step just being to fill our letter with objects in a quick and random way. For trickier letters, sometimes it works better to place multiple planes in different areas of the letter so that everything gets filled in more evenly. So for example, if I jump into front view, select our particle emitting plane, and hit tab to enter edit mode, with it selected, I'll hit shift D to duplicate it, move it somewhere else, and then left click to place it. And since we did that in edit mode, both of these planes are still part of the same emitter object. 
Now let's tweak some more settings. Under the emission tab, let's change the number to something like 500, the end to 100 so that after frame 100 they stop emitting new particles, and the lifetime to 300 so that they have plenty of time to bounce around before they start disappearing. Next, under the rotation tab, let's first enable it and then set the randomize to 1 so that each particle's rotation is fully randomized when it's emitted. Now that we have these settings locked in, we just need to head back to frame 1 and hit play, watch them bounce around for a bit, and then when we're happy with the random distribution, just pause it there. Don't worry if areas of the letter aren't quite filled in, because in the next step when we apply physics, shit's gonna hit the fan because we've got a bunch of particles clipping into each other and everything's just gonna spread out everywhere. With the particle emitting plane still selected, under the modifier tab, if we look at the particle system, we should see that there's a button that says make instances real. What this does is make every single particle version of our object here into real objects, which is why I told you it was necessary to make a collection for each letter earlier. So first make sure the plane is in the right collection by either dragging it in or with it selected hit M and then choose the correct collection. Then go ahead and click make instances real. After a second, we should see hundreds of our object all instanced and we're good to hide our particle emitter plane from both the view layer and the render layer. Now on to step three, where we need to make our objects interact with each other. What we need to do first is make sure every object has a rigid body property on it so we can simulate their physics. So let's first select our source object and then head over to the physics tab and add a rigid body. All of these default settings should be perfect. Active, meaning it'll be affected by other rigid bodies and forces, and convex hull collision shape, meaning that when Blender is simulating the physics for this object, it's not gonna be the exact mesh that it's simulating. Because depending on the complexity of your mesh, that would take a lot of time and power to simulate. Although if you've got a beast of a computer, go ahead and switch that to mesh, but uh, good luck. Just to give you a really rough understanding, what Convex Hull does is essentially place your object in a bag and then takes the shape of that bag to use as the collider for the simulation. It's less accurate, but it's a lot faster to process, and depending on the shape of the object, the difference isn't really noticeable. Anyways, now that we've got our source object set up, you'll notice that our instanced objects don't update to have rigid bodies too. But all we have to do to fix that is select all of our instanced objects by hitting one at the bottom, then holding shift, click the one at the top, then still holding shift, click the source object we added a rigid body to in the viewport. If you did this right, you should notice that all the instance objects are selected the same color, but the source object is a slightly different color, meaning that it's the active object. Then just go to Object, Rigid Body, Copy from Active, and all of our instance objects should have the same rigid body settings as our active one. The last things we need to do physics-wise here are make the letter into a rigid body collider so that our objects are actually contained inside of it, and add a turbulence force, which is just basically going to churn our objects around a little bit and add some motion to them. First, let's select the letter, remove its regular collision, which doesn't work with rigid bodies, and add a rigid body to it, but set it to passive, which basically just makes it act as a collider for rigid bodies. Finally, make sure the letter's collision is set to mesh, since we need this collider to be accurate because it'll be containing all of our objects and forcing them to stay in the shape of the letter. To create the turbulent force, just hit Shift A like usual, head to Force Field, and choose Turbulence. I found that setting the strength and noise amount both to 10 and then just slowly animating the position of the turbulence did the trick just fine. And now, if we head to frame 1 and hit play, everything should just explode into a total mess because like I said earlier, we've got a ton of objects clipping into each other and now that we have proper physics enabled, they're just going to explode and pop out of each other. The solution to this uh, little problem is to play a game called Delete a Bunch of Them and then run the simulation again. It's a really fun game, so fun in fact that you'll have to play it probably 5 to 10 times. So just head to frame 1, hit play, and then after a little bit, pause the simulation, select a bunch of the objects while holding shift, and then just hit X to delete them. Then head back to frame 1, hit play again to recalculate the simulation, and we'll be just repeating the process until we have the explosion of objects under control. Once we get there, what we want to do is let the simulation run for a second so that everything seems calm, and then freeze everything where they are and essentially reset the rigid body simulation, with the goal being that on frame 1, they'll all be positioned as they are right now in a calm state. So after running the simulation, once you've paused it at a nice calm frame, select all the objects like we did last time, head over to Object, Rigid Body, and Bake to Keyframes. Make sure the start and end keyframe are both set to the keyframe you've paused it at and hit OK. Then with all of them still selected and the keyframe selected as well, make sure your mouse is over the timeline and hit X to delete it. Now we have no physics applied to these objects and they're all just frozen as they are right now. So if we again select all of the instance objects, hold shift and select our source object in the viewport so that it's the active selection. And once again, we're just gonna copy the rigid body from active. And now we can finally head back to frame one and rerun the simulation where everything should be calm and reacting to each other nicely from the jump with a little bit of turbulence. For step four, we're just hiding our letter from the render so that all we see are our objects filling the letter up. Of course, that's just one letter, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that if you're trying to do this effect, your word is going to be more than a letter. But after you repeat the process a couple more times, it's honestly pretty fast to just finish off the rest of the letters. 
After I finished making the whole word, I pretty much just animated the camera's position and rotation to end with the full word in view, and then start really tight on one of the letters. Then I just played with the camera's motion path in the graph editor to make it start slow and pick up speed as it dollied back, and finally added some lights. For my glasses example, I placed a sunlight hitting it from the top to act as my key light, and another less bright one from the back right to act as my backlight, which is just there to pop it out a bit from the background. After rendering it out in Eevee, because I don't have a computer powerful enough to get the results I want in Cycles, I brought it into After Effects for some final touches. One thing that actually helped a bunch with the After Effects work was installing the After Effects camera export plugin, so I could export Blender's camera motion to an After Effects camera, which basically just allowed me to drop in the of edits text in After Effects and have it match the correct motion fairly easily. To install it, you can just download the file in the description, then in Blender you can go to Edit Preferences Add-ons, click Install, find where you downloaded it, and then double click it. Then making sure you've got it enabled, you should be able to select your camera, head over to Export and export the camera just like that. Now finally in After Effects, in a new project, I just imported the image sequence we rendered from Blender, making sure to right click and interpret the footage to the correct frame rate I rendered it out in. Then I went to File, Scripts, Run Script File, and chose the saved Blender camera data. And this is great because it creates a new comp for us with a matched camera already inside of it. Then I brought the rendered image sequence in, created some text for my subheading, and right away pre-composed it making sure to move all attributes. This way we're free to work on its dissolving in transition in an isolated comp without worrying about it affecting anything else. Still in the main comp, I made the subheading layer 3D and rotated it and positioned it where I thought it should sit under the main title. Now inside of the subheadings comp, I just added the rough and edges effect to the text and animated the border from something high down to zero to have the text fade in. Then I selected the keyframes and hit F9 to ease them and then played with their speed graph a little bit to make the dissolve more interesting. Now back in the main comp, I just slid the subheading layer over in the timeline to appear at the right time and then it's all sorted. For the background, I wanted to create this subtle radial gradient from above because that's the direction the key light is shining from. So I created a new solid layer, made it 3D, rotated it to face the camera, and then added the gradient ramp effect. I set it to radial and then made the A color a warm, dark, orangey yellow. Funnily enough, actually, if you look up the hex code, that's what it's, it's called. Uh, and then I made the B color a yellow toned off black. After that, I just positioned to the centers to get the gentle gradient I was after. I also wanted to add some smoke elements to the background to make it more interesting, so I grabbed a few from a footage pack I had, but that was just because I was feeling lazy. And if you happen to be less lazy, I go over how to make some pretty good looking smoke all inside of After Effects in my fog tutorial that you can check out later if you want. I layered a few smokes at different opacities and then just pretty much moved on to creating the master adjustment layer. The first thing I added to this is the noise effect. Adding a small amount of noise is a great way to remove the light banding you usually get with gradients, and also just makes the whole thing look a little more polished. Next I added a levels effect to lower my gamma and input white. I did that to make the highlights pop a little bit more because it was looking a bit flat and dull. And lastly, I added a couple glow effects. I've spoken about this a bunch in other videos, but basically if you stack multiple glows at low intensity with different feather amounts, you'll get a much richer glow than just one glow effect can give you. So I set the intensity to 0.1, set the glow threshold to about 40%, and then set the radius to 10. Then I duplicated the glow, and this time I set its radius to 20, and again one more time with its radius set to 50. And here's the before and after of the glow. It's not too over the top, but it gives a warmer feeling in my opinion. Then I just moved the master adjustment layer down below the subheading comp because I didn't want the subheading text to glow, and I called it a day. And that's it. That's my breakdown of how the Chucky TV series intros are made. Feel free to leave suggestions for what else you'd like to see me break down in the comments below. Now it's time for what I'm sure you've all been waiting for, the no context poll. This is the part where based off of a Twitter poll I create, giving you absolutely no context, I let your votes influence something I do in the next tutorial. The poll options for this video were Monion and Sus, and the majority of you picked Monion. You did this. This is your fault. Very good. If you want to participate in next video's no context poll, be sure to follow me on Twitter and turn on notifications so you don't miss out. Links in the description. Now let me take a second to thank this video sponsor, Skillshare. If you weren't aware, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes for creators. They've got a ton of topics you can explore, but the ones that I'm personally drawn to were film and video, productivity, and creative writing. A class that I watched recently that I think you might enjoy is Cinematography Basics, Understanding Filmmaking Style by Zach Mulligan. He goes over tactics for manipulating mood, tone, and feel, and organizing shot lists so that you can get a handle on your shoot and not miss out on anything important. 
If any of that sounds good to you, then give this course and Skillshare a go. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, so you don't have to worry about ads, and they're constantly launching new premium classes for members so you can stay focused and follow where your creativity takes you. If you're interested in joining, the first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Thanks, Skillshare.